Along the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway on the Maryland shores of the Chesapeake Bay sits the new revived United Methodist Church, one of four traditionally black churches in the area founded after the Civil War. The area is rich in American history and biodiversity, and rising waters are putting it all at risk. Too bad you weren't here. Like last week, we had a ton more waterfowl. Swans, a couple thousand geese, snow geese too. I think they took off. I'm not sure if they're still we're down there. We're still a group right of snow now. geese yeah. that's still down there. Still a few. I'm Dan LaDuke for the Pew Charitable Trusts. Welcome to After the Fact and our season on Ocean, People, Planet. And that was Marsha Pradings Long greeting residents in Cambridge, Maryland. She manages the nearby Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, and she is working to ensure a sustainable future for this unique place that's home to the iconic bald eagle as well as thousands of migratory birds each year. Her job goes well beyond the wildlife. The surrounding community depends on the jobs and tourism revenue from the Chesapeake Bay, and people are a big part of her work, which is made all the harder by climate change. There is no time to waste. We have a a limited little window to be able to save our marshes. It's certainly an issue that we cannot tackle alone. We need all of our partners and we need the public. We need the public to care. And that's where I think refuges can be so important when it comes to sea level rise and climate change, because not everybody lives this. Not everybody sees it. Not everybody cares about wildlife like some of us do. That brings us to our data point for this episode, 2.1 feet. In a report on climate change for Maryland officials, scientists estimate that coastal waters will rise as much as 2.1 feet in a little more than two decades from now. That means if you're patient and stand at the water's edge, it'll rise up past your knees by 2050. It's happening now. Blackwater has seen thousands of acres of its land submerge in recent decades. Like many communities, a changing climate is affecting the local economy and wildlife this region's future and its past. We traveled to Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge and spoke with Joseph Gordon, who directs Pew's work on conserving marine life in the United States. His team's research is helping us understand how the health of the ocean affects coastal areas like the Chesapeake Bay. It's just so quiet. Well, it's quiet, but it's... If you take time, if you listen closely, this is one of the amazing parts about this place. You'll hear the spring peepers, which are the little frogs, starting to croak, and the insects and the birds, and um, it's a different kind of a chorus. Rachel Carson did her research near here. Is that right? I did not know that. Yeah, in Patuxent. And, uh, you know, she wrote about Silent Spring. And so we were talking earlier, if you look to the right, not right now, but earlier there were bald eagles and even juvenile bald eagles, and they're recovering. And so you don't have a Silent Spring, we actually have spring coming to light. Uh, so it's an inspiring story that you can experience if you come to a place like Blackwater. It is true. As, as soon as you just still yourself, you realize how much sound there actually is happening here. Yeah. We're right on the edge of the Chesapeake Bay. How does that tie into the broader issues facing the ocean? So the Chesapeake Bay, uh, it is like a beating heart connecting life throughout the ocean and across continents. The osprey that you might see catching a fish diving down, and it's usually in Atlantic Menhaden, (laughs) which is a fish that feeds on plankton and then goes along the Atlantic coast and then feeds every predator you can imagine, including whales and and the osprey themselves, after feeding on these menhaden, uh, many of them will travel south to the Caribbean or even to South America before coming home. So these epic journeys were at the crossroads of some of the Earth's most amazing migrations all begin de- uh, or depend on the Chesapeake Bay. If you were bringing someone here for the first time, what would you want to show off to them? Well, I think the salt marsh hides its treasures. So if you sit closely and wait, you might see a great blue heron come by to fish or an osprey swoop down. But uh, also, it hides some of its challenges. So you might see some trees that look a little thin off to the left, but they actually are ghost forests. These are trees, yeah, you can see them on the left there, those pines and hardwoods. 
that are becoming submerged under salt water and they can't survive. And that's actually true as well for some of the salt marsh and other habitats. And so you're seeing um, in fast motion compared to the rest of the country, uh, the effects of climate change. And so the areas there are areas that will change. And so the question is, can land be conserved upland so that we can have this kind of a habitat even as it shifts inland? I'm looking at those trees and I'm glad you told me that some of those are evergreens because I couldn't have told otherwise. They're so, they're so sparse now because yeah. of what's happening to them. Yeah. They're just spindles. Yeah. Are we right in the marsh here that, that you were describing earlier? Some of this is marsh, uh, more what you can see in the distance. And there are different animals in here. So for example, what you may not see here because they're very, very depleted is the salt marsh sparrow, which is this amazing bird it's only adapted for a salt marsh habitat, and so it does migrate south, but when it comes here, it depends on a very short season to lay its egg and rear its young, and that is between the two high tides that happen every month. And if it doesn't, if those tides change, then it'll flood. And so in a way, the salt marsh sparrow is like us. It depends on us to be able to thrive and to preserve a habitat that it can survive in. From bird watching to hunting to hiking, more than 200,000 people visit the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge each year to enjoy the recreation and respite it provides. We came here to ask Marsha Pratings Long about other lessons this place offers. We are at Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. This is your baby. Many of our babies, yeah. yes. <laughs> I've got a great team. Yes. The reason, of course, we came is we want to learn more about the impact of climate change and the encroachment on some of the lands here. How has it changed in those however many decades? Well, we have seen a lot of change. We have a lot of folks come here to learn about sea level rise and to witness it. This is something that we have a number of universities doing extensive research on. And if you go out on the Wildlife Drive, you will see all this, what they call Blackwater Lake. That used to all be marsh. And through the process of sea level rise, it has turned into open water. We have lost 5,000 acres since the 70s of marsh to open water. And at the same time, that marsh has begun to migrate into upland areas as well. So you'll see dying trees along the edge of the marsh. That's what people call ghost forest. And then you'll actually see dying trees within the forest. And you'll see marsh grasses moving up into those areas. And that is all a direct consequence of sea level rise. And it's been happening for, for many, many decades. But it's very apparent here because we are at ground zero for sea level rise. We're very flat. We don't have much elevation. We don't have a lot of development. So you can see all these natural processes at work right here. And that's why we're here, because it is such a vivid example mm -hmm. of what's occurring almost before our eyes, but not realizing it may maybe elsewhere. Yes. But here you can truly see it. What kind of challenges does that present then for someone in your position to how to manage a refuge? It's not like you can make it like it used to be. So once upon a time, as biologists and ecologists used to try and work towards these pre-colonial conditions of the environment. So what used to be here before settlers came? Uh, it was marsh. And now you look at it and say, is this practical? to actually restore this open water into marsh? Or is it practical to keep this marsh where it is? Or is it going to migrate? So we've had to have a pretty significant change in the way we think about restoration and conservation as well. Because there are areas that we may say, we need to let that revert. We cannot restore it back to what it was before. And we might have other areas that will say, well, okay, this used to be upland forest. We see the changes that are going on. It makes sense to allow it, we can't stop it, some of the natural processes, to actually allow it to become marsh. But the marsh that's coming in now is not the same marsh as yesteryear. It's full of Phragmites. Phragmites is a very tall grass from Europe. It does not have nearly as much wildlife value as all of our other native marsh grasses did before. So we have to think, well, how do we manage that? And that's not easy. Part of that change thinking is partnership. And as Joseph Gordon points out, it takes a number of stakeholders working together to combat the impact of climate change. People uh, will talk about that there's no silver bullet 
but there is here, and it's partnership. You have communities of foresters, agricultural communities, Native American tribes, and people working to preserve Harriet Tubman's history in the Underground Railroad, people working in the military to protect the country. It's people working together, everyone in the community and, and outside it, to create a world we want to live in. We hopped in the car with Joseph and drove along Wildlife Drive, which circles the refuge, to see more evidence of the changes happening at Blackwater. If you look to the right all along this road and left, you'll see ditches that were dug. In some cases, they've dug them so that roads don't flood, but in some cases, to eliminate mosquitoes. So basically, managing this park is not the usual routine. You're, it, you're actually can't take it back to what it was because what it was is now underwater. Right. It can't be something from the past. It has to be something we actively decided to be in the future. We're fortunate that we're in a refuge, but yeah. you are making the point that most of the East Coast is going to be privately held land. So what are the challenges with that? The story of Blackwater Refuge is much bigger than the refuge itself. It's the partnerships they've built with the community. Most of the U.S. coast is privately owned. With sea level rise happening, we can't solve that problem with just new parks and refuges. That's not going to happen. And so what really needs to happen is people coming together to help you know, with the parks, with the refuges, with state parks, with private lands, everyone coming together to develop a plan for the future uh, so we can create the kind of coastal habitat that we need and the wildlife that depends on it. We're affected on COD installations by more frequent flooding as a result of climate change, storm surge, and other climate and environmental challenges across the entire landscape. One of the biggest partners in protecting the Chesapeake Bay and Blackwater may not be one you'd expect. It's the U.S. Navy. And that was Kristen Thomasgard, Program Director for the Department of Defense's Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program, she explains how mitigating climate change in areas like the Chesapeake Bay is critical to the economy and national security. Kristen, let's start by just talking about the history of the relationship between the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge and the military. It's been going on for a long time. It has been. Um, the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge is in a really key location beneath some critical airspace for the Department of Defense and for the Navy in particular. Uh, where they train pilots and, and train on a lot of important aircraft. Part of that process involves needing to maintain a very uh, safe, quiet, and dark space beneath that training area. Part of what is so important to the Department of Defense is our stewardship of important natural resources um, and important waterways. And I think the relationship that exists with Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge and the partnership in that entire landscape is really an incredible example of how a very diverse set of partners that you would not expect to come together have come together for a common cause, which is to preserve that space, to increase the connectivity of that landscape for both the purpose of preserving that resource, protecting the water, and maintaining that military mission. By bringing those diverse perspectives together, you can grow the partnership, you can grow the, the sources of funding and the types of programs that are available uh, to protect that important resource. Blackwater is also maybe not the first place that comes to mind when you're talking about climate change, changes in the ocean. But of course, it's all part of this large ecosystem. The changes that are happening at Blackwater, the water encroachment and other things, what impact does that have on, on the mission side of your concerns? So we really can think of our, our military installations and military facilities as being part of the community in which they're located. Flooding, storm surge, and, and other climate and environmental challenges, we've looked at those issues as really a risk management challenge that we have to face and assess particularly at a, a facility like Patuxet River Naval Air Station, where we have um, very expensive equipment, very sensitive systems that we're testing. Any kind of, of weather impact there is significant. 
and having access to the facilities, having access to our runways, having access to the roadways. Again, it's the same types of challenges that any community would face in terms of getting people from place A to place B, moving our equipment from place A to place B, and ensuring that we're not negatively impacting our ability to do the work that needs to be done there. Most of the folks who work at our facilities live in the community. When the roadways are affected, people can't get to work, people's homes are flooded. That impacts the department's ability to accomplish our mission because our mission is accomplished by our people. And those people are affected in the same way as anyone else in the community. And this is the first time I think we've burned in over 10 years or so. Yeah, it's been a while. I was talking to the Marsha Pradines is increasingly seeing those effects, flooding and closed roads, and the very land itself disappearing. In the last few decades, you've lost 5,000 acres to what are now, it's now covered with brackish water, right? Yes. Um, what is the practical effect mm -hmm. of that loss of, of land to the species who, who live in black water? Well, certainly we lose diversity. We lose the species that used to be there. Black rails are one that have had a 90% decline in just the past decade or so. You lose what is really the heart of, of the marsh. All these different types of plants and birds and, and wildlife that really make this area special. And just last year, we had our first shot mentored hunt. It's a mentored hunt program for adults who've never hunted before and they want to learn, but they don't have anybody. They didn't grow up with that tradition. And wouldn't you know it, we had this uh, very bad storm. You try and drive down most of the roads in the southern part of the county, and it was absolutely looked like a river. That was from increased storms and increased winds and everything that happens because of uh, climate change. Most of this winter, we spent a lot of time cutting down trees that had already fallen from all the high winds we had, from the storms that we had. And our maintenance staff and our fire crew were out there just trying to clear the roads. So those are things that we see at any point throughout the year. Is there anything special to be done with an existing marsh mm -hmm. to maintain it? Yes. What we do when we're addressing climate change here at the refuge is we have a strategy called Blackwater 2100 that we developed in conjunction with the Conservation Fund in Maryland Audubon, D.C. And it looks at a number of strategies. So one of them is Phragmites control, an invasive control such as Nutria. Uh, another one is strategic acquisition. Where are the marshes going to migrate to and, and where are the forests going to persist? We should acquire that if we can. But it also has to do with pinpointing those high quality marshes that are worth trying to save and restore before they're gone. So it's really this three pronged approach that's important because if you wait till the marsh is gone, it's too late. As Marsha looks to the future, historian and author Kate Larson looks to the past. The legacy of the Underground Railroad and the stories of families who lived near the Chesapeake Bay are intertwined with the landscape. The area is rich in black history with places like New Revival United Methodist Church, founded in 1876 for communities to freely worship. Near the shores of the Blackwater River also sits the birthplace of Harriet Tubman, and this year marks her 200th birthday. Kate Larson tells us more. I wanted to go back and ask you about that very first time you visited Blackwater. As a historian visiting a place like that, how important is it for you to be able to immerse yourself in a landscape? First of all, it's beautiful. The marsh and the wildlife, it's spectacular. And there's a lot of water. It's very low land. It would have been very difficult to describe her life without being there and seeing those fields and the forests, the marshes, the rivers and the streams, that sky, that beautiful sky. It's so pristine. It was very easy to see Harriet Tubman and her family on that landscape. Tubman did not leave uh, letters or diaries behind for us to uh, hear from her voice what it was like to grow up on that landscape to work there, to live there, uh, to escape from there. So um, as a biographer, I had to piece together her life. You went there for the first time about how long ago? 
It was in 1999, so that was more than 23 years ago. And over your visits, you've seen you've seen that place change. Tell us about those changes. Oh, it, it has changed. The land is very mushy now. Uh, it's spongy, whereas it wasn't that way before. And there's a lot more water uh, on the roads. You know, high tides. There's more water that seeps into the the travel lanes. Um, and some of the back roads, actually some of them become inaccessible certain times of the year, certainly during a full moon. When there's heavy rains, um, it's much more difficult to get around. Are things, um, physical sites, artifacts from that time still left that might be affected by the, the rising waters? The plantation that Tubman was born on um, and where her father lived and worked there were at least 40 enslaved people at a time there. The state of Maryland um, has been doing some archeological work at um, a site that they're calling Ben Ross's cabin site. Um, it would have been where Harriet Tubman's father lived. There are other sites nearby and, and I fear that they're going to be lost before we can find them and, and preserve them. There's the story of slavery and many of us know what that horrific story is, but there's another side of it. There's that, that community, and, and they raised this brilliant woman. And it's really, really important for us to find those sites. I'd like to be able to at least virtually populate that landscape so we can tell the stories of the people, those enslaved people and the free people that they were married to, related to. They're the people that raised Harriet Tubman along with her parents. They educated her. They taught her how to survive on that landscape, how to survive slavery. That was her classroom. And I would like to see it preserved so that we can tell those stories. Archaeology is definitely being threatened all over the world because of sea level rise. That's Julie Shabliski, chief archaeologist for the Maryland Department of Transportation. With her team, she's working hard to unearth American history before rising sea levels wash it away forever. In the case of Ben Ross, what we noticed is that we would excavate a five foot by five foot excavation unit and dig down about not even a foot. And we'd leave and come back the next morning and our units were full of water. So what that's telling me is that within the next decade, I don't know if Ben Ross's site is even gonna be around anymore. It could be completely submerged. We're really in a race against time because it's eating away shorelines that where people lived thousands of years ago. So a lot of these sorts of sites are really just being washed out into the bays, into the rivers and the oceans. In your work previous to this location, have you run into saltwater intrusion and, and the effects of climate change before? All along the Chesapeake Bay, the cemeteries are being impacted by the sea level rise and you'll see actual coffins uh, coming out into the bay. I've also seen native people, their sites that are 1,000, 2,000 years old, seeing oyster bins, which are basically areas of shell that have been eroding out from the water. Even when we were looking for the lost colony of Roanoke, you could see how the edge of where they lived was being eaten away by the wave action. So all these sorts of things have always been a problem for archeologists, but it seems to be escalating at an alarming rate. Tell me how you first heard about this site. I mean, did you know what you were looking for when you came here? Well, everybody knows the name of Harriet Tubman. Oh, you bet. So that's a very, of course, exciting name to think about when you're asked to go find an archeological site when I was first called up, um, it was by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Marsha Pradines, and she said, you know, we just acquired this property, and we think we know where Ben Ross's home is. How do you even begin something like this? The first step that we do as archaeologists is that we look at historic documents, historic maps, and we lay those out in front of us, and we think we look at and try to determine where a dig area should be based on, for example, in this case, Ben Ross. Is there anything that talks about this person? And it's hard to find historical documents that talk about enslaved people. But Anthony Thompson, who enslaved Ben Ross, did have a will, and it mentioned Ben in his 1836 um, will. And what it said is that he gave Ben 10 acres of land. And 
through looking at other deeds and historical documents, we were able to find an area within Anthony Thompson's 1,000 acres where Ben could possibly have lived. So that's where the archaeology begins. We know that people live along roads, that they need water, and so we thought that the best way to begin this search is by walking along this old historic road and digging shovel test pits. Shovel test pits are simply foot and a half diameter holes where archaeologists take the soil out of the hole, they screen it, and look for the presence or absence of artifacts. We began doing that, digging shovel test after shovel test after shovel test. And I thought it'd be pretty easy to find pe where people lived all over the place. They have, there have been people living here for thousands of years. But interestingly enough, after the 700th hole, I began... <laughs> 700th? I became a little frustrated. I said, where is this place? You know, all we needed to find are some broken dishes and old glass, some nails that suggested there was a building here. But I was finding nothing. My metal detector has always been with me because it's a quick way to find an historic site. All I need to do is have some metal, rusty nails, buttons. So I took it out and within the first couple minutes, I got a hit. I thought, this is great. Maybe there's something interesting here. So I got out my uh, trowel and began to dig the hole up. And I pulled out this metal object. And I was shocked. It was a coin. Well, it couldn't be that old. I rubbed off the dirt, and the year was 1808. So I just couldn't believe it that, you know, I found this just after the first couple minutes of looking. And the reason 1808 to me was almost this omen that we needed to keep on searching and digging is because that is the year that Ben Ross and Rick Green, Harriet Tubman's parents, were married and began their family. But within a couple days, we found the site. What was that feeling like? The feeling was amazing because we knew how big of a find this would be, not just for an archaeological crew, but for the descendant community, for the people of Maryland, for anybody who has looked at Harriet Tubman and her family as inspirational. So this was a, a big moment. I sense this real excitement about what you're doing. You clearly have it about your work, but about this site, there's something special you can tell. The special thing about this site is that there are living descendants who remind me of why I do this, that it's not just about the old things we find in the, in the ground, it's not just about the people that even lived before. It's about the people living today and what that past and those stories mean to them. I think about how these stories are gonna keep on being passed down from generation to generation, and I'm, I'm hoping that archeology span can have a small part in that. As the various partners around the Blackwater Refuge continue to maintain the changing habitat, Marcia says she's eager to share what they've learned. As the rates of change are happening faster and faster and, and we're seeing how things respond, one of the things that's very important to us is to share what's working and just as importantly, what's not working. And to be able to continue to see tens of thousands of waterfowl, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years from now, seeing eagles still on the landscape, that's what this is all about. So, I have to look at the big picture, not just the sea level rise that's at our feet right now, but what is the future? And what do we want to see? For photos of wildlife and our interviews at Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, as well as more resources on what you've heard about this episode, please visit pewtrust.org slash ocean people planet. Thanks for tuning in to our Ocean People Planet season. We'll be back soon with more episodes focused on how researchers and people living along the ocean's coasts are working on innovative solutions to address the challenges facing the ocean. Until then, I'm Dan LaDuke for the Pew Charitable Trusts, and this is After the Fact. <laughs>